Greetings, dear friends. I'm glad to welcome you again, and today we're going to talk to the esteemed Igor Mihailovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mihailovich, we live in a special time, the time of the truth, and the light of this truth is shed more and more on various events, on the secrets of history, on the actions and motives of both individuals and even entire religious institutions. But beyond that, this time, the time of crisis, the time of wars and cataclysms, is also a time when everyone can take a very honest look at their life and evaluate it, including their spiritual life. And this kind of internal audit scares some people, especially people who find themselves in some extreme situations, while for other people it is the other way around. And you know, if we take, let's say, the events in Ukraine, a very interesting question arises. Why did some people, being in the basement of a high-rise building, when shells were landing, when everything was exploding, falling apart and shuddering, Why did they feel inner joy, peace and placidity? And this is a very important question. Why joy? It would seem that just one more instant in your life, this earthly life may stop. Yet they felt joy. Meanwhile, when other people were, let's say, in a relatively calm situation, when there was no immediate threat to their lives and the shooting was somewhere very far away, they felt a great desperation and, I would even say, panic. What's the reason for that? Why is there such a big difference? In fact, this is elementary. Those people who, even being in extreme conditions, under real threat to their lives, actually felt inner joy. Is it normal to feel joy in such a situation? Of course it is normal. Well, not from the point of view of psychology. If a person is spiritually mature, then the approach of physical death, which occurs not by his will, I emphasize, not by his will, but from external factors, this gives inner freedom. Why? Because a person who has worked on himself spiritually, who developed, no matter in which religion, but he is truly in contact with God himself, with the spiritual world, he feels this connection. And when he realizes that at any moment he can part with his physical body, then precisely the spiritual component of the person himself begins to dominate. So, naturally, he feels placidity, he feels peace, because he realizes that he is a human being, not a body. You see? Mm -hmm. And that's where there is a huge difference. Let's just, for simplicity of explanation, apologies, friends, Let's call it as follows. For instance, the material man or the material component of a person himself. Let's call it an ape, okay? According to Darwin, we originated from an ape, hence an ape, whereas the spiritual component is the angelic essence, an angel. The ape and the angel. These are the two components of one person, while the second person felt fear even being safe. Why? because he is far from the angelic essence. He still remains an ape. And for an ape, the death of its physical body is a state of subpersonality. Any person feels and understands that. Hence fear, hence anxiety, hence panic, and awareness that you are losing not just the habitual way of life, sort of something is going to change, but this is a disaster for consciousness, for personality, it's even worse. Why? Because this is eternal slavery. And that's where this state of fear and anxiety actually arises. But it is even inexplicable. It comes from within, from personality itself. And here, a person certainly begins to fall into despondency, a depressed state, and hopelessness. He is unable to do anything, and so forth. Do you know what else is interesting? It's interesting that it happens not only to people who engage in spiritual self-development, who have some connection with religions, who comply with everything, 
but also to people who are far from religions. Exactly. And many people said this is so paradoxical that they actually hoped. Especially those people who felt fear and panic, they say, we hoped that perhaps our affiliation to some religion would give us privileges and we might somehow endure those events easier. More calmly. And some people noticed that the sense of fear, the sense of pain, everyone is equal before this feeling. Absolutely. And in general, they feel pain in the same way as atheists do. In this regard, they understand that something must have gone wrong in their spiritual life, that they have both resentment and irritation towards themselves. Certainly. They cannot cope with it. Of course. And there is an understanding, well, It's just that you start pondering over what is indicated by the fact that a person feels panic while being a religious person, a believer. No, he's not a believer. Not a believer. He is not religious. He's afraid that he won't be saved. He is an egoist. He knows that. He's an egoist who considers himself to be a faithful believer, that he has been fulfilling everything, so God should take care of him and so on. You know, there are people like that. We all know them, who shift responsibility onto others. Let's say, being already adults, they still remain little monkeys. Why does this happen? Because we were brought up, and we bring up our children. A child begins to demand something, he wants something, and we immediately give it to him. If we don't give it, all he has to do is to cry, and we give him what he wants so that he stops crying. Thus, the child begins to understand that it's enough for him to cry and to be capricious for his parents to give him something. And the child begins to manipulate this way. Afterwards, he manipulates his entire life. Meanwhile, he treats God as a father, as a parent. In other words, since God is the father, he already owes me. After all, what kind of attitude towards parents has been embedded since childhood? A consumerist attitude. And exactly the same attitude arises in an adult towards God as a parent. I mean, a little monkey. That child who is stuck in a human and hasn't matured continues to dominate. And such people, many of them consider themselves very spiritual. They even sometimes perform something of what is prescribed in their religions. But in fact, they are far from God. They revolve around their own selfishness, nothing more. And naturally, when there is a threat to their life or something goes wrong, they take it very hard. They become stressed, while for many people, It is up to the point of destroying their psyche. Why? Because their mindsets, concepts, all understandings and hopes are broken. So a person considers himself religious, as you say. That he already belongs to God. That he belongs to God. Yes. According to his understanding, God must carry him in his arms and protect him from everything. Right. But suddenly there is a threat, and he understands that he is equal, the same as all people. In other words, there are no differences. But how come? He is special. After all, he considers himself special and thinks that God must protect him and solve all his problems. Hence, there is an inner conflict. Let's consider other people who are really on the spiritual path, who really work on themselves, where personality is mature. Let's say the angelic essence, not an apish one, predominates in them. And these people perceive such situations in a completely different way. Even when the world is falling apart, they have peace inside. Why? They are not tied to the body. They are not tied to this material world. They have life inside. And this is really a joy. The joy that just one more instant and a person can meet God Himself, meaning the spiritual world. He can meet there others like Him, those whom He constantly feels. Naturally, joy arises in a person. Consciousness cannot explain to him why it is so. A lot of our friends told us that they experienced these moments and were themselves surprised why. Consciousness was surprised, although inside they knew the answer. They knew that they would escape from this vanity into eternal joy, happiness and simply into heaven, as they say in Christianity, right? Right. You know, a parallel is also drawn with the Holy Fathers. It was very surprising that they called those hard times in their lives the times of persecution, the times of prisons, camps, wars, 
the happiest moments in their lives. They said, it will be difficult for you to understand this, but those were the moments when God was particularly close. Of course. When a prayer was so strong that later on… It was very difficult for them. It was very difficult to achieve this very degree of dialogue with God, this very purity. It's natural. The more difficult the conditions for the body are, the freer personality is. When consciousness is preoccupied with panic, tough conditions, illness, life threat, imprisonment or persecution, it panics, consciousness panics. Then personality becomes free. And then a person already begins to see himself from aside for the first time. Again, if we return to the scriptures of Holy Fathers and look at what they talked about, that which some of them called the descent of the Holy Spirit upon them, the insight and so forth, what does that actually mean? For some people it means he has suddenly become a Buddha. Well, if we mix all religions… Within an instant. …to understand the essence, or a saint, mm -hmm. as some people consider. No, my friends, this is just the primary experience of realizing that you, my friend, are not an ape, that you are an angel, that you are personality. But there comes another understanding that consciousness is active, that demons are not somewhere out there, you know, it's like, let's put it in a civilized way. The priestly institutions, their especially outstanding personalities came up with the idea that Satan should have horns, a snout, like a pig, hooves, a tail, and actually look like a goat, you see? That is, they drew it from themselves. I don't know what kind of mushrooms they ate before that, but that's the kind of images they came up with. And they imposed them on the unstable psyche of their parishioners. So people think, if it's not that devil who comes, then it's not a devil, you see? So a devil has to appear to him like this. In such an image. With such a genetic cocktail, then it's a devil. And personally to that person. And personally to him, of course, or even better, not just a devil, but Satan himself. After all, he's the greatest man. He's honored. Yes, because he was, excuse me, in a church and lit a candle. So what devil would come to him? Satan himself must come to him, right? He's an egoist of the highest degree. Well, that's how it happens, you see. I mean, well, in fact, Satan is in everyone. Demons, Satan, whatever we call it, it is consciousness. Consciousness is a material structure. Yes, it's a field structure, but it belongs to the material part of a human himself. So that's what happens. It is mortal, it is fearful, it is envious, it is always mean and bad. If an ape predominates in a person, then no matter how he expresses his humaneness or something else, filth gets through anyway. With the subtext. An ape is an ape. No matter how it hides behind some mask, behind some image, it still shows through it. But there is another component, angelic one, in a person. If it predominates, no matter how much a person tries to hide the angel, it is felt. Well, that's natural. A lot of people in this time of acute life events very vividly felt this division within themselves, that there is… That's right. This is what insight is. This is the descent of the Holy Spirit, as those very elders used to say. Why? Because for the first time, a person gains a real experience, a real experience that he is not an ape. He breaks away from his consciousness, and he can already, as an observer, see what's going on. He understands that consciousness is pushing him. He is overwhelmed by some emotions, fear, or consciousness pushes him to do something, but he already controls it, and he already sees this process, and he understands that consciousness is not him. He understands what his consciousness incites him to do. Having this experience already, he begins to understand what it is for and what the consequence will be. And that's where he can already easily control, stop this process, and so on. Well, we say that it is easy. In fact, all this is complicated. What did those very elders say? That precisely after this insight, the inner Armageddon begins, meaning the struggle itself. You know, I very well remember the words of Seraphim of Sarrow, when he was once asked the question, what is the difference between a drowning sinner and a righteous man, and even a saint? And he said that they differ only in their determination. That was so interesting, meaning the determination to act, the firm intention to belong to God until the end. 
to wage this struggle. Right. And everyone is actually in the same conditions. But consciousness says that my consciousness is probably more aggressive, it is somehow attuned more severely than that of saints or messengers of God. Surely, of course. It's the same for everyone. Everyone experiences it the same way. It's just that there are people who see a goal, set it for themselves, and simply don't notice obstacles. Why? Because they begin to live by the world of feelings, by the spiritual world, and then they really strive for God. They get tired of being an ape. A human is actually a supreme being, and to remain a primate at that is somehow insulting. That's where another pridefulness, the true one, holy pridefulness, makes them move towards God. Not in order to get something, but to stop being an ape and to become a human. That's what pushes them, while for others it is vice versa. When the animal essence predominates more in a person, he has more of an ape in him than of an angel. He cannot separate himself as personality from consciousness. Consciousness is strong, while he as personality is lazy. Then, of course, not very good things arise. Why? Because consciousness often creates an illusion that he is so righteous, he can know a holy scripture by heart, he knows what comma was placed where, and so on. However, he will not become more spiritual because of that. Even observing and knowing all the rituals and everything else, that's really true. Skills and some knowledge are one thing, but all those skills and all that knowledge, without personal experience, is just a burden that he carries. His entire life turns into a theatrical action. It's like an actor on a stage. But at the same time, he will have a very high self-conceit. He will treat God as a parent, demanding everything from him, and from others too. Well, such are people, such is the world. Right. You know, a lot of people, when they caught this note of some inner resentment against themselves, they realized that there had been certain expectations, and they started to figure out what kind of expectations those were. They caught themselves on the fact that, yes, they understand in theory that at the last moment they won't be saved. However, they fell into this trap of the system. They thought that they could repent at the last moment and everything would be resolved. Almost, of course. And then there comes this acute moment of awareness. Of awareness. And you realize that you have wrongly set priorities in your life, that… No, it's not a person who sets priorities, they are being imposed on him. It is being imposed that, yes, you believe the system. You see, I'll put it this way, if a person is not engaged in self-development, but simply trusts, entrusts his life to someone, well, let's say, we entrust our everyday earthly life to politicians, right? So they must make decisions instead of us on how we should live and what we should do adopt relevant laws and everything else. We entrust our spiritual life to clergymen of the religion we belong to, and we shift all responsibility onto someone else and continue to exist, excuse me, just like animals. So, we were driven in one direction and we went there. We were driven in another direction and we went. That's why all this takes place. But if a person begins to develop spiritually, he really feels this need, while everyone feels it. It's just that some people grasp at this straw. You see, one person grasps at the straw and comes out on his own, while others push away even a log. Why? Why bother themselves if there are priestly institutions that are obliged to do that, so people rely on them? But afterwards, there comes an awareness that a person doesn't know anything, doesn't know how to do anything, and his life has been literally lived in vain, right? His life has not been lived, it has been burned. No matter what he accomplished during this life here, well, our life, if we actually look at it, let's look at it from a perspective of, let's put it simply, even from a perspective of or regarding our planet, how long our planet has existed and how long we have existed. After all, these are material commensurable things. We live very little. We basically exist for a moment, but this moment is given for us to actually gain real life. You know, it's like a butterfly emerging from a caterpillar. This is really that way. And then the butterfly can contribute to the emergence of many more butterflies, because a caterpillar won't be able to do that. It's just a caterpillar. So while we are caterpillars, we need to become angels butterflies. 
What do we need to become them for, in order to save others, to understand this process, to go through it ourselves, and then to share it with someone else, right? That's the way it is. That's how the world is arranged. In this short life of ours, it is very short. But it is more than enough for a person to be saved spiritually. But unfortunately, priestly institutions, which have taken on themselves the entire spiritual responsibility, sort of have taken it away from people. They say that it's enough for you to repent before you die. You know, such a fairy tale. If you simply say, yes, I renounce evil, I repent, and the like, you mutter the words, I accept Jesus into my heart, and that's it. And that's it. And you just say, yes, I accept. But what is in practice? But have you accepted Him in practice, my friend? That's the question, right? If you are a Christian, your heart must be the home of Jesus Christ. Yet, look within yourself. Is He there? Just honestly. That's the answer, right? Everything is very simple. Well, let's go back again. Everyone started with this honesty towards themselves. Yes. Let's go back to the elders who surmounted this path. Yes. Why? Because this is the experience of ordinary people who surmounted this path and shared it with others, right? Because there are the same stages in all religions. I emphasize, in all religions. There are no exceptions. Why? Because the truth is one and the same. It is that mechanism, or what do we call it? It is that path. It's the mechanism. In fact, I mean, here, you know, it's like… There are tools. Yes, it's a tool that you take. It's available, yes. You use it. It's a working formula. And some doors open for you, some effects occur, then other effects follow after them, and everyone goes through that, except for monkeys, who have formed extremely high opinions of themselves, and their consciousness draws them that they are, you know, just boom, and that's it. They are already spiritually free already know everything and know how to do everything. Well, this opinion disappears very quickly when a person encounters reality or some danger. Then they remain with broken dreams, you know, like in a fairy tale. In other words, they've lived their lives, but they haven't gained life. That's what is scary. Yes, indeed. A lot of people understand that those piles of megabytes of information, even gigabytes of information, do not actually make you a spiritual being. Spiritually free. That where you need to advance, you need to move. You have to resolutely take some decisive steps internally. Of course. You know, our attitude to the spiritual, to spiritual practices, and to the spiritual world in general, is akin to the consumerist format. If I perform spiritual practices, my body shouldn't get sick. It means I should gain luck and success in all my endeavors, in business and in everything, so nothing bad should happen to me. God must protect me, protect the territory where I am. Definitely, for sure. Like what is said in the previous video, a shell will land anywhere, but not on me. How? How can it land on a saint, right? because God is sitting and protecting him. He definitely safeguards his people. Of course. There are such things too. It is his already. It is his child. Won't you save your child? You will. So why should such a person be afraid? God will save him because he is the Almighty. He, let's say, will turn the bombs around, won't he? And he will change the situation and stop the climate so that this child of his could live in peace, right? Yet, I have a different question, friends. Now that we've started to approach this from afar, let's actually look at the lives of true human beings like Jesus Christ and the Last Prophet. I think they are quite outstanding people of our modern era, let's say, I mean of our civilization. This is our recent history, and they are those who are the examples for millions or even billions of people, aren't they? They are. Let's look at their lives, how hard it was for them to break free from that very consciousness. It would seem he is the Son of God, he knew who he was, but was he free from that very consciousness, from those very demons? Many will say, how's that? God was supposed to set him free, like many of us think, right? That is, a person just went to a church, or it doesn't matter, to a mosque. He attended it once, 
And that's it. He's already a spiritually free person. He's already a saint. Then why did Jesus Christ have to resort to such very strict practices? I mean, in order to subdue this demon in the head. It's the biblical story. Forty days in the desert. Yes, I mean, he was taking his body to the point when consciousness was already giving up because it could die. Well, there is another nuance here. The nuance is that he was actually a free personality. He was a spiritual being, and the death of his physical body gives him freedom and nothing else. And consciousness understood that perfectly well. Here, naturally, he forced this consciousness. But I wouldn't advise you to repeat this after him. There was a lot of simony in this regard. Many tried to repeat what Jesus Christ did in order to ditch their consciousness once and for all. And many died and became subpersonalities. They were not saved spiritually. And they lost their lives and lost their chance too. You see, Everyone has their own way. One shouldn't fool around, one should cherish life. Let's take the life of the Prophet Muhammad. He is the shining example for all people. I emphasize for all, all religions, all denominations and so forth. Why? Because of his reverent attitude. To his last breath, he was clinging to the spiritual world. How much time he spent in practices, how deeply he performed spiritual practices, and his life was extremely difficult. There was persecution and everything. He had a lot of problems, but he never gave up. Right? And how reverent he was precisely about spiritual practices, about contact with God's world. Why? A simple question. After all, he was the Prophet himself. God loved him and singled him out among millions of other people. And yet, he was constantly clinging. What did he ask God about? Did he… High society. Absolutely right. Did he ask for daily bread? I don't know, for material goods, for victories in war, or anything else? No, friends. It is us who ask that when we come to a mosque or a church, we want magic. Whereas he was asking for one thing, to be part of the high society all the time. Even though he seemingly had a guaranteed place there already, nonetheless, every moment, he was proving that he was worthy of it in order not to lose his ground. Right? Mm -hmm. But how do we have it, friends? Occasionally, we visit a temple or a mosque. We perform a spiritual practice or a prayer. Every religion has its own ones. It doesn't matter. It's a spiritual practice, let's put it this way. So we did a spiritual practice, that's it. We have cleared our accounts with God, you know, like paying off a debt, right? So you bought yourself a place, and the rest of the time you are one-on-one -on -one with your consciousness, or rather your consciousness continues to dominate you. Will you become an angel? No, my friend. As you were a monkey, so you'll remain one. The whole point is to control the beast all the time. When you control the beast, you are an angel. When the beast controls you, and you don't even see it, you are an ape. And that is true. Isn't that so? It is. You know, it reminds me of the biblical parable about the wedding feast, when there were so many invited but few chosen. And why didn't people come? They had been called. The call was constantly coming. They didn't come because some people were busy with chores, some with trade, some with work in the fields. And only then did people realize that they used their lives in a wrong way, that they didn't allocate their time correctly. They were either hindered by, I don't know, someone was hindered by his spouse, someone by his work, someone else by something else. That is, something constantly hinders people. You know, our friends wrote to us, and people I met, often complained about not having enough time. They say, I wish I could drop everything and go to, let's say, a temple or seclude myself somewhere and really perform spiritual practices in order to get… Well, that's a tremendous experience, isn't it? It's a real opportunity to get in touch with the spiritual world so that nothing distracts and hinders me. But I can't. Work, family, obligations, there is no way out, they say. That's how hard it is for them. Poor guys. 
Do you know what I'll tell you, friends of mine, who listen to your own consciousness from the monkey that is telling you that you have potential but no opportunity to develop spiritually? Drop everything, take a vacation, take a tent, well, preferably in the summertime, of course, and go somewhere to a safe place, but with no one around to pester or distract you, at least for a week, and try to perform spiritual practices to become spiritually free. And we'll see. You know, people like that will not succeed. Why? Because they will run away from people, but they won't run away from themselves because they'll take the ape with them, while the ape actually predominates. Poor angel, excuse me, it's like, you know, the ugly duckling. Remember, there was such a cartoon in our childhood. So I have this feeling when I look at some people. I always recall that cartoon, you see? The state of their angelic essence is the same as in that very ugly, downtrodden duckling somewhere under the baseboard, because the big, strong ape has intimidated and frayed the poor thing. And this little chicken is crammed somewhere and cannot get out of his hiding place and fully develop. Mm -hmm. I also remember how you said that something always hinders the ape. Either a trunk is slippery or bananas are hanging somewhere too hard. Of course, an ape is never satisfied with life. That's why I say, go and try. Seclude yourself and you'll encounter problems that you never knew you had. But it's one thing if a person is really tuned for a fight, you know, he will go, take a notebook with him, and start writing everything down. At least he will free himself. He will see that no one and nothing hinders him, except the ape in his head, or as they say in religions, demons or something else, consciousness, it doesn't matter, the system, whatever we call it, it's a problem, a problem we are born with. It's just, you know, the two components, the animal part, an ordinary monkey, and the angelic part were taken and combined. But in order for this cocoon, it's not even a caterpillar, but a cocoon, to form a butterfly, a person must overcome, he must win, a victory must take place. Victory over oneself, right? Meaning, victory over one's active component, which clings to this world, for which this three-dimensional world is native. But this world isn't actually native to personality, and personality basically doesn't see it. Without consciousness, personality doesn't see this world and doesn't perceive it. So consciousness serves as an intermediary. Therefore, consciousness can do anything, create a lot of problems, make you distracted when personality should fund, give more energy and the like. In other words, invest its attention in the wrong direction. But when your attention, my friends, for whatever reason is invested in something material, you do not invest it in the spiritual world. And if you don't invest it in the spiritual world, you will get nothing. You know, you can perform any external actions you like. You can not only go and kiss the hands of clergymen, but you can, pardon me, kiss their asses, give them everything you earn, sell everything you have and give it to them, and have them pray for you from morning till night. Nothing will happen. As you were a monkey, so you'll remain one. Excuse me, friends, for being frank. No one can save you but yourselves. You have to understand. You know, a human is indeed dual. And heaven is not a zoo. Apes don't belong there. That's true. You know, there's also a problem that people have moved far away from God. Unfortunately, as of today, people lose this connection, you see? There's too much information, and there are too many problems. We have problems with health, we have pandemics, and we have problems in politics. So, mass media load us with external problems to a great extent. Moreover, economic crises begin, everything becomes more expensive all the time. We cannot escape from the circle of these problems of life, and we have no time to stop and just look inside. What is happening to us? Thus, you see, we already catch ourselves at some high emotions and the like. And here, people say, the problem of modern times. But on the other hand, my friends, if you really want to, if you feel and understand, if you really love God or strive for Him, then this entire vanity is just a Klondike. There is no better time 
for spiritual salvation than nowadays. Why? Because you see the fuss of this ape, and you realize that it is climbing a tree with its last strength in order to pick that banana, you see? But as a personality, as an angel, you understand that this is the ape, and it's not you. It's enough to stop inside. Yet, does our modern life impede people's spiritual liberation? No, friends, it does not. It's just that you should take the example of the most worthy ones, of that very Jesus Christ, how much time He spent, let's say, in spiritual practices, and how much good He did. Or take that very prophet, the last prophet, the most worthy among people, and look at how much time He spent in practices, and how much good He did. And did they have a good and easy life? No. Was their life easier than yours and mine? No. Were there fewer threats? No. Excuse me, apes even crucified Jesus Christ. Just think about that. Did he really have an easy life? But some people will say, yes, but he's the Son of God. He actually knew. Yet, who hinders you? Tell me honestly. Who prevents you from making a little bit of effort and feeling God? The spiritual world. After all, the door to the spiritual world is always open. Yes, the ape is trying to enter there, but it will never be able to. The spiritual world is not a zoo, and the ape doesn't belong there. Whereas when we try to force our way there while being a monkey, and why do we force our way there? In order to get something and to learn magic, right? in order to dominate other monkeys. Well, let's be honest. Therefore, a monkey will never be able to feel the spiritual world. But each of us are, pardon me, little chicken driven under the baseboard by the healthy, strong, aggressive ape, knows that there is God. Well, you know, some people are such proudlings that they feel better considering themselves a big, and strong ape, you know, like a gorilla that breaks and bites everyone. Then, admitting that he's a small and miserable chicken, driven under the baseboard, but with a chance to become a beautiful swan. Isn't that so? A real angel. And to fly up into eternity, and to become equal among the equals, to be part of the spiritual world. What will we choose? Just think about it. Nobody hinders us, and we have examples to follow. There are the most worthy ones. It is difficult to find anyone worthier than Jesus Christ and the Prophet Muhammad. But they were people just like you and me, weren't they? However, some will again say, but he was God. Yes, in him there was. There was an angel in his body, but his ape was just like yours. And it hindered him in the same way, too. But he tamed it. Yes, he knew who he was. And don't you know? Stop lying to yourselves and stop listening to apes and acting like apes. And you will see how the world will change. You will see how you will transform inside. This is really simple. But here the apes start saying, well, if I do that, everything will change. My friends won't understand me. My relatives will turn away from me. You know, friends, here's a simple question. I'm sorry, I'll put it straight, okay? How long does our human life last? Just a little bit. And where will you be afterwards? Will you be with your relatives, your friends, and a mass of strangers on whom you're trying to foist this monkey as something outstanding. Yet, this is what all of us do. We actually live for other people. We care what people think about us. Where will you be afterwards, my friend? What is more important? What people think about you? Or who you become? Well, the question is not even who you become, but who you are. Who are you, a mortal ape, 
or a part of the spiritual world, an angel. You know, people do not want to listen. First of all, they do not want to listen to themselves. That's where the whole answer is hidden. What does it mean that people do not want to? Who doesn't want to in a person? Who doesn't want to listen to this whisper that is there? The eternal whisper inside, from soul to soul, as they say. Who? Only a monkey. So, how weak should you be? Let's put it in a civilized way to trade your eternal life for an existence, a very short existence of a monkey, you know? Friends, this is true. But if you enjoy being monkeys, that's your choice. However, it's not worthy. That choice is not worthy of a human. A human is here in order to gain life, to become an angel. And the ape must serve the angel. But for that, the angel has to become strong. That's the whole mechanism which is there and which everybody went through. Again, why have I mentioned Jesus Christ and told you how He was undergoing practice? He struggled for a long time, and then even He had to break this ape for 40 days because it was big and strong. You know, let me explain it so there are no misunderstandings. The stronger the personality is in this jug of dual nature, the stronger the ape is. Because just imagine how much inner power and what tremendous potential there is when an angel comes. What will the ape be like? Well, like on steroids, you know, just for our understanding, big and strong, three times bigger than Schwarzenegger. Isn't that so? It is. And the weaker a person is spiritually, the weaker the ape is. Well, it's all balanced, proportionally balanced. But the best way is to start from the following position. I mean, you start developing the angel. You invest attention where it is necessary, and the ape cannot catch up with you. Thus, it is easier to overpower it. As for spiritually free beings who are here, it is much harder for them. This is really so. It's like the example of Jesus Christ or the Prophet Muhammad, right? The greatest of people. He was actually so strong spiritually that he really helped a lot of people, and he helps to this day. He was indeed a favorite of Allah, God Himself, whom God chose among many. Didn't God give him power? He did. After all, God Himself sent His archangel to him in order to teach him. Right? Right. Imagine what kind of power his ape had if it began to develop in such conditions from childhood. However, knowing that, the Prophet subdued this beast inside himself every moment. Yet, is this really difficult for us to do? Or does anything hinder us, any of us? No, friends, nothing hinders except the ape. If you are a religious person, you need to go to a temple, but don't want to. The question is, who doesn't want to? If you have a spiritual practice, you need to do it. You feel and you want to do it. But here, a lot of reasons arise. And the ape creates such conditions that you have to urgently run to a store, wash the floors, or lie down, you know? In such a case, the ape wins. Then what is left? Then what is left for you is to listen to priests and believe in their fairy tales. Well, you know, no matter how much we believe in their fairy tales, no matter how much we hope that someone will do something for us, the truth is harsh. Those very holy fathers from those very religions say that everyone has to surmount this path. Everyone has to face Satan, and everyone has to win, because it is all the same from time immemorial. There is nothing else, because it is the truth. And if we are afraid, we don't want to face it, we don't want to fight, we are afraid that we'll go crazy when doing spiritual practice because the world begins to change, we become split, 
So who is afraid? The ape is afraid to lose power because the angel begins to grow. That's where the choice is up to us. It's like Tatiana mentioned Seraphim of Sarov when he said, Determination. Determination. If we have determination, we will win. We will not surrender. You know, simple advice. In a purely human way, approach a mirror and look at who you are. Try to see an ordinary ape. Just face the truth. Yes, it may be quite pretty, not the kind we are accustomed to see at the zoo, but it's the result of evolution, nothing more. All we see in the mirror is just an ape. Looking at each other, we see apes. Yes, I'll say it again, it may be beautiful, intelligent and educated, but it's just a monkey. While what we feel, what is not the material component, that one is able to live forever. So what should be developed, my friends? I'm not saying we shouldn't study or something else, you know. As a matter of fact, we should study all our life. Didn't the Prophet study? He studied until the last day. So, why shouldn't we study? We should. Every day. Otherwise, the day is wasted. If we do not study on that day, we should learn to become people, learn to be more humane, Learn to love, elementary, simple things. But you know what? People do not know what love is. People do not know what it means to love. People do not know what it means to be faithful. Indeed, people do not know that. We are losing it all. So, until we learn what love is, we won't be able to gain life. Whereas, being in fear and submission, you know, it's like a hunted dog. Well, dogs do not even belong in a temple, not to mention the spiritual world. Therefore, friends, everything that is material is mortal. Everything that we see with our earthly eyes, it will all vanish. And what we see in the mirror will vanish. But what we feel, what is not material, yet much higher than any matter, that can be eternal. That's what we should develop, that whom we feel ourselves inside, but solely from the spiritual position, I emphasize, because consciousness also begins, let's say, to put its sticks in our wheels, create false images, sensations, and emotions. And people who do not have spiritual experience confuse spiritual perception and perception through feelings with inner emotion and self-conceit. This is really so. Everything begins with the truth. One should develop and learn all the time because a master is always a disciple. One hundred percent. If a master believes that he is a master, that he has achieved something, and he is perfect, he's just a schizophrenic, nothing more. While a true master is always learning, he understands that there is still a lot he should learn. But it is necessary to start with love, friends. So, let's just love each other. That's the simplest thing but it's the most powerful. It is what gives life and hope, not just to each of us, but to all of us together, to the entire world. Because love, love really saves. And it saves not only us, it saves our planet too. And it saves the entire humanity. Well, that's the case if there is a lot of this love. While in order to ensure that there is a lot of it, each of us has to work on oneself, right? To radiate more of it. The more the better. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, friends.